situated between the Republic of Karelia and Leningrad Oblast, lies the largest lake on the European continent. Known today as Lake Ladiga, it was known to the Germans as Aldoga and to the Vikings as Aldegia. It is possible that the name stems from the Finnish Alodejoki, meaning lower river, or the Karelian Altokas, wavy. Indeed, Karelians and other Finno-Ugrians inhabited the shores in its ancient days, but they were not the only ones and not the first inhabitants. Archaeology points also to the presence of Balts. In the early Iron Age and before, the tribes seeked out a nomadic existence around the lake. Though they would congregate around places of worship, burial and ancestral grounds, home was primarily where the game was. They sustained themselves on hunting and fishing. They traveled close to shore in rafts, rudimentary boats made from stretched hides, and dug out canoes. They hunted animals like squirrel, fox and beaver, whose furs were highly prized for their warming qualities and aesthetic beauty. These furs were especially prized in the deep south, the sprawling empires of Rome and Persia. It appears as though the tribes managed to transport their produce into these lands. Time has grounded the furs to dust, but archaeological findings exist in Finno-Ugric lands of sudden silverware in the form of coins, cups and bowls. Roman records also make mention of such commercial ties. On the Baltic coast, the inhabitants maintained an ancient trade route revolving around the export of amber. The riverways of Eastern Europe had played a vital role in the region's development, not the least in the late Iron Age. Its inhabitants have seemingly always used it for transportation, and there's reason to believe that these long journeys were undertaken by the nomads in their humble boats. However, many points of these rivers are dangerous at certain times of year, and for much of winter, they are frozen. Thus, it is very likely that trade was conducted as much by the ski and the sledge as by boat. The precious furs of Lake Ladega also drew the attention of the immediate west. It is not known for certain when Scandinavians first began to infiltrate the area. Archaeological evidence points to Swedish settlement on Åland in the 7th century, an important waypoint to the east. Hordanes wrote of them trading in dark and sapphire colored skins as early as the 500s. Of note is that it doesn't seem like the Swedes back then traveled to Rome themselves. Hordanes wrote how they sent by way of trade through innumerable other peoples the sapphire colored skins for Roman use. A change began to happen in the middle of the 8th century. In the Middle East, the Abbasid dynasty seized power from the Umayyads, moving the capital from Damascus to Baghdad. The new caliphate promoted trade, an extended palace court, and an increase in coin production. Thus merged a ruling elite with a lot of purchasing power and interest in luxury goods. Furthermore, an alliance was struck in 1759 between the caliphate and the Khazar Khanate, opening up new trade to the far north. Around the same time, Arabic silver coins called Derhum start appearing around Scandinavia and around Lake Ladiga. It is at this point in time that a permanent settlement appears in the region, commonly known as Staraya Ladiga in Russian, meaning Old Ladiga. It was seemingly known in Old Norse as Aldegyuborg, Ladiga city. It is located 13 kilometers up the Volkov, a river connecting Lake Ladiga to Lake Ilmen in the south. Aldegibor was situated on the inflow between the Ladoshka and the Volkov, with the older settlement built on the southern shore, and a smaller district constructed on the northern one in the 9th century. A burial ground called Plakun was built on the eastern shore of the Volkov, and has proved an invaluable source for archaeological findings. Aldegibor sits right on the northern trade routes to the east. For those traveling to Byzantium via Rus, it was obligatory to stop in the settlement, but the Byzantine trade route did not become truly popular until the 900s. Before then, most of the Nordic trade was conducted via the Volga River, with Caesarea and the Caliphate. On this route, Aldegibor was technically optional, but seems to have been frequented nonetheless. After a long trip from Scandinavia, it was a convenient stopping point for replenishment, trade and ship repairs. Many are the findings of iron rivets and planking, which would have been used in these ship repair workshops. And after all, the Vikings had to trade their own produce for the local furs. There is uncertainty among historians in regards as to who built the settlement first and why. Some say it was created by Slavs in the 600s, others that the Scandinavians came first, and it was in 753. 
the situation appears highly complicated and dynamic. Slavic findings are few, and most historians seem to agree that a Slavic presence wasn't frequent until the 10th or 11th centuries. A few Scandinavian objects can be dated as far back as the Vendel era, but in 2001 an early settlement was found, predating the one from 753 and containing no Scandinavian traces. It consisted in part of a 2 meter high wooden rampart, covered with earth and faced with stones. Two kilometers downriver stood a hill fort, constructed in the late 7th century. This fort contains no Scandinavian findings, only native Finnic ones, indicating that they were the ones in military control of the region. The site was most likely a place of worship for the Finno-Ugrians, as it contains a large amount of grave mounds from the 7th and 8th centuries. This small settlement and religious focal point, seated right on the crossroad between the Balts, Finns, Scandinavians and Slavs, made it a perfect place for seasonal markets. Winter was likely the season for trade. The frozen rivers allowed for easy access by everyone, farms could not be worked, and the skins of the fur-bearing animals were at their thickest and finest. The founding fathers of the new settlement appear to have been craftsmen. Evidence points to their early workshops being seasonal, temporary constructions. They operated in a wider complex, whose forge had walls of light wickerwork, drainage channels, and lacked any solid roofing. The craftsmen were both blacksmiths, glassblowers, and jewelers working with amber, gold, and copper alloy. These items were not only Scandinavian, but Baltic, Finnic, and Slavic, indicating a cultural melting pot. It is interesting to speculate why these craftsmen appeared in this place and operated in this manner. Around the same time as the growth of the Ladiga trading post, similar emporiums appeared across the northern hemisphere. Most important were Dordestad in Frisia, Hedeby in Denmark, and Birka in Sweden. All of them appear interconnected, as goods from one location appear in the other. For example, Frisian exports to Aldegjuborg included walnuts and clay pitchers, known as Tadingerware. It appears as though the craftsmen traveled seasonally between these settlements, bringing their goods, materials and craftsmanship with them. The style of glass beads found in Aldegjuborg have also been found in Birka and Hedeby. It wasn't only luxury items. Combs of a uniform style, made from bone and antler, appear across the entire network, and even as far as the British Isles, from which Aldegibor imported tin. It either indicates a flourishing exchange, or the constant shuffle of traveling craftsmen. But eventually, it appeared preferable for these craftsmen to sell down. While it was historically believed that the Scandinavians conquered Aldegibor from the Finnic locals, it now seems likelier that the new settlement was the result of a long procedure, most likely initiated by these craftsmen. There are no traces of violence until the late 9th century, and remnants of weapons are scarce throughout the entire period. The first living structures in Aldegiborg appear to have been constructed in 753 AD. They were large houses built from wooden logs, consisting of an anteroom and a main room, with a central, rectangular fireplace. The wet ground was covered with wickerwork mats. Such wickerwork was also covered with clay and used to make walls. All of these features are Scandinavian. The other cultures did not make use of wickerwork. Slavic fireplaces were located in the corner of the house and made of clay, whereas Finnic hearths were small, square-shaped, and made of stone. Thus, Aldegibor's founding fathers appear to have been predominantly Norse. These buildings lasted until the late 10th century, and around the same time, they were replaced by Slavic houses, small, square-shaped timber huts with fireplaces in the corner. It is not certain what the permanent population of Aldegiborg ever was. The Emporium at Birke appears to have had a year-round population of between 700 to 1000 inhabitants, the number swelling during the winter markets. It was likely the same for Aldegiborg, though the settled area was never extensive. It was first and foremost a trading post. The inhabitants seemed to have prospered and been well off. They made fine jewelry and dressed nicely in wool, linen and silk some of it domestically produced by local weaveries. Findings of Scandinavian gaming pieces indicate some of their pastimes, and they also imported wax candles, earthenware, and may have had horses, as attested to by findings of bridal mounts. Another interesting finding dating to the mid-9th century is a wooden stick inscribed in Futhark. The inscription is believed to either be a poem, praise to a dead warrior, or the invocation of an elf in the underworld. Whatever it means, 
The stick indicates the presence of a strong Norse culture and religion in the area. But Aldegibar's primary purposes in the larger network were the exports of amber from the Baltic to Scandinavia and the funneling of silver dirhams from the Caliphate to the entirety of Western Europe. Aside from the massive silver findings in Eastern Europe and especially Scandinavia, the coins reached as far as Francia. In 789, Charlemagne's edicts paid special attention to new standards of weights and measures, just as a heavier silver denier was introduced in his lands. This was most likely caused by the influx of the dams. This wealth did likely attract some jealous attention. The geopolitical role of Aldegibori has always been obscure, especially in the early days. It's not known how it was governed and by whom. Was it ruled by a local chieftain? Maybe a council of powerful traders and craftsmen? Perhaps it paid tribute to Slavic, Finnic or Swedish chieftains? In the later centuries, both the Novgorodians and the Swedes showed considerable interest in the region. In the 13th century, Icelandic priests began to record the sagas of Nordic heroes and clansmen. These were based on oral tradition going back centuries, but often embellished. Some of them speak of Aldegubori in the 9th century, but it's not entirely certain how accurate they are. Most interesting is the saga of Halfdan Eysteinsson, which describes the government and events surrounding Aldegubori. However, it never provides an exact date. According to the saga, the city was the capital of a kingdom, which also consisted of neighboring Alaborg, believed to have been the archaeological site located on the river Sias, on the eastern shore of Lake Ladiga. Alaborg was the site of a jaldom. The kingdom was subject to several intrigues, attacks and conquests. It was considered part of the region called Gartariki, realm of castles. The saga of Studlag the Industrious also mentioned an attack and conquest of Aldegubori, but it makes no mention of Alaborg or surrounding cities. The rulers of this saga are different from the ones in the previous saga, but interestingly, the daughters of the kings in both sagas are called Ingjad. In 1019, Princess Ingjad of Sweden married Yaroslav of Kiev and received Ladiga as a dowry. Perhaps the sagas, written 200 years after this incident, mixed it up with the much earlier events it concerned. The true story has most likely been lost to time, leaving us to speculate all we like. Norse political control of Ladiga can be questioned in this period, since its sole military defense, the Lubsha Hillfort, contains no Scandinavian findings. It's believed to have primarily served as an outpost. In the settlement itself, there is a considerable lack of weapons, apart from toy swords. This carefree nature appears to have been to the Ladigans' detriment. Between 863 and 870, the settlement was burned down. So, what happened? No one knows. Maybe it was the result of a Viking raid, or a brutal conquest, as described in the sagas. Maybe it was an accident. Some have attempted to connect it to the events described in the Kievan primary chronicle. According to the chronicle, in 860, the tribes around Ladigan Lake Ilmen decided to violently expel the Norsemen, who had forced them to pay tribute. A few years later, the tribes invited a Varangian named Rurik to rule over them. The exact details of this mythological tale seems unlikely, but the timing of the events appears to coincide with the archaeologically proven inferno. Neither the chronicle nor the saga seem to agree, so the truth probably lies somewhere in between, or completely outside. Either way, the inferno provoked some much-needed change. At the end of the 9th century, the hillfort at Ljubša was abandoned, and Scandinavian influence appears to have increased not only around Ladiga, but Eastern Europe as a whole. As the 10th century developed, Scandinavians seemed to have become influential in other emporiums, like Mostava and Kiev, as they gained an interest in trade with Byzantium. Around the same time, Aldegibor was fortified by a fortress made from wood and limestone. This marked improvement over the previous lack of defenses indicates the settlement's importance. Compared to the previous hillfort, the stone one contains Scandinavian objects, hinting at a shift in the power dynamic. From this period, there is also evidence of agricultural colonization. Findings include farming implements, like an iron plow from Middle Sweden. These are not only found at Aldegiborg, but also neighboring settlements like Liubsha. According to data from carpology and pollen analysis, there is a similarity between the type of grain cultivated in Ladiga and in Sweden. There are also traces of plowed land buried under soil, so the initial purpose of the settlement as a trading post 
may have expanded as the years went by. But by now, the settlement had begun to decline in importance, in favor of other locations, especially Novgorod at Lake Ilmen, which would grow into an independent republic in the 11th century. At the turn of the 10th and 11th centuries, Aldegibar was seemingly attacked and burned down again, perhaps contributing to its decline. Scandinavian influence was likewise declining in Eastern Europe, though they had settled the lower Volkhov in force in the 10th century. By the turn of the 11th, they appeared to have rapidly assimilated with the local Slavs or Finns, or been entirely replaced, perhaps as a result of the conflagration. Aldegia was now called Ladega, and formed the northernmost part of the Kievan Rus. Its princes had a tendency to ally with the Scandinavians who frequented these lands, employing them as traders and mercenary warriors. In 1019, Jaroslav the Wise married Princess Ingiad of Sweden. In return, she received the territory around Ladiga as a dowry. Ingiad made Ladiga an autonomous Jarlstam, ruled by Ragnvaldur of Sweden, and subject to the Swedish king. This coincides with Sweden's global decline in this period. The eastern trade route was closing down, overseas tributaries had revolted, and religious conflicts were brewing. Several attempts were made to restore the kingdom's old glory, claiming Ladiga might have been one such effort. After Ingjad's death in 1050, it appears as if Ladiga was integrated into the Novgorod territory, but its autonomy and geopolitical status is uncertain. In 1105, the Chronicle of Novgorod mentions how Prince Mstislav made war against Ladiga. Was the city still powerful enough to resist sudden influence? The resistance proved unsuccessful. In 1115, the Novgorodians built a new stone fortress upon the Cape, solidifying their control and marking them as a true mercantile overlord of northern Russia. I realize that this video might have been confusing due to the poor documentation and disagreement between scholars. So let's conclude with a summary, attempting to draw a possible timeline of events. The cape between the Ladoshka and Volkhov rivers, located upriver from Lake Ladiga, has been inhabited by Finno-Ugrians since the Iron Age. In the 7th century, they built her a small settlement, a hill fort, and a burial ground. Other cultures like Balts, Slavs, and Scandinavians appear to have frequented the site for trade. In the 8th century, craftsmen used it for seasonal workshops, which eventually grew into a permanent, primarily Scandinavian settlement. However, the region appears to have been militarily controlled by the Phoenix. Aldegibor was part of a trading network connected to Sweden, Denmark, Frisia, and even Central Europe, the Danube, and Bohemia. From all of these places they imported combs, earthenware, candles, walnuts, salt, and other fine items, but primarily luxury goods. In the 9th century, the settlement was burned down, it was reconstructed, the hill fort abandoned, and replaced by a stone fort in the town itself, all of which seemed now controlled by Scandinavians. They used it as an important trading hub on the route to Byzantium and Persia. They built farms and worked the land of the region. In the late 10th century, the settlement burned down again. At this time, the Scandinavian buildings are replaced by Slavic or Finnic ones. The settlement loses its importance to southern Novgorod, but is granted autonomy and is ruled by Sweden in the mid-11th century. Though the settlement makes some resistance, control was soon ensured by the Republic of Novgorod. If you enjoy the content I produce, please consider supporting me monetarily by becoming a channel member or patron over on Patreon. You'll find the necessary links in the description box below in addition to the sources used for writing the video script.